Hey everybody, welcome back to the best bourbons of the century so far. Here we are. This is the final one. The one that wowed my palate in ways that I still think about. The whiskey was so good, so spicy and complex with so much going on. Now, but before I get into what is number one in the interview with the distiller who was a part of it, I want to talk about this list and I want to talk about why I chose to do it. Well, it's Bourbon Heritage Month and this has not been your typical Bourbon Heritage Month. We haven't been able to be in the same room together. We haven't been able to go to distilleries and mingle in bars and, and do uh, in-person events. And really, you know, for us like hardcore bourbon geeks, it's kind of heartbreaking. And so I wanted to do something that celebrated bourbon. Now, a lot of people have asked me why I didn't include rye, why I didn't include uh, barrel finishes. Look, those are fantastic products. But the fact is a barrel finish is its own category. And really, I think it should be separated from bourbon. I would like to see the federal government come up with uh, a special classification for the likes of Angel's Envy and Fourgate. Great products, I love the flavor. They do great things, but I think we should separate them from bourbon, especially in something like this. I don't think it's fair to compare Four Roses uh, to say an Angel's Envy. They're completely different styles because that second barrel alters the flavor from it being simply a bourbon. It is now a finished bourbon. So I just think it's a little muddied right now in a labeling. Doesn't mean I don't like the products. I just think it's a little muddy. Now, why didn't I include the rye whiskeys? Well, rye whiskey is its own category, and I will indeed come out with a list of the best ryes of the century so far. And you might guess that a lot of them are coming from one distillery in Indiana. So I think that that list is not as exciting for me to kind of compile because, you know, it's a lot of a one distillery. But this list for me, this list is also kind of like a a culmination of my career. I have been covering whiskey now. Once we hit that, you know, January, February time frame, I will have been covering whiskey for 15 years. And this is a, this is something I'm so passionate about. I care so much about bourbon. I care so much about the community of bourbon. And I care so much about these distilleries, even though I am critical of them at times, I still, I still kind of root for them, you know, because if the distilling business is doing well, that means Kentucky is doing well. And that means that there can be future people who write about this. I, I look at what I do as a career. As many people look at food writing and wine writing as a career, I think whiskey writing should be a career. And so everything that I do is in hopes that it grows into be something else tomorrow. And so this list is, is I hope somebody can take this and analyze it and look at it, you know, 50 years and 50 years from now, 80 years from now, when I'm long and gone, and take it and put it to put it to use on their own list. And hopefully, some of these bourbons will still be in existence, and they can compare them to something that was distilled in 2060 and bottled in 2080. That's kind of the hope with this list: is that it it adds to something else in the story of bourbon. But what we've had in the top five. It was very difficult for me to choose, especially when we got down to the bottom, to the final two. Uh, the one that came in at second and Jefferson, 17 year old, I stand by my thoughts on that, that it is so complex and it's so unique. It noses like a brandy and has the complexity of something made in the 1960s. It, should, it is just so friggin' special. So it was really difficult to make the decision of what came in at number one over what was number two. But at the end of the day, I chose what was number one because of the consistency of this particular product line. So here we go, here we go everybody. Coming in at number one. Bourbons of the century. At number one, the Four Roses Limited Edition Small Batch, 125th anniversary. This was so glorious, so complex, so beautiful. When this comes out in 2013, 
Four Roses has already had a really incredible run of great, great releases, and they would continue to have several more uh, be just outstanding. The 2015, the Al Young edition, um, you know, you in, in, and you take the 2012, you just flip a coin, and any one of those could be the best Four Roses that have come out in this century. And in fact, if we were to expand this list into the top 50, I would tell you that every single one of the Four Roses limited edition small batches would be on that list. That is how special Four Roses limited edition small batches are. Everybody wants to talk about the Buffalo Trace Antique Collection, which is an incredible release of whiskeys, being the one that most people sought out, you know, seek and try to get. And they want to talk about how highly coveted Pappy Van Winkle is. But to me, the most, the most beautiful, the, the most consistently special limited releases in all of bourbon have always been the Four Roses limited edition small batch. This was a composite of OBSV 18 year old, OBSK 13 year old, and OESK 13 year old. Simply one of the more unique you know, combinations because they normally do four mash bills in their uh, limited edition small batch to this point. This one had three and I think it changed the game and those whiskeys were so incredible. And I brought on the master distiller of Four Roses, Brent Elliott, to talk about them. But this is by far the most difficult decision that I have had to make uh, on this list from uh, one to two because I thought they were very close but I made the decision that this is the best because of the track record and also the finish was probably about 20 seconds longer than the Jefferson 17 year old for me so this is a this is the longest finishing this is the most complex this is the spiciest bourbon that I have tasted in the 21st century and it just wows my palate every single time I taste it. So congratulations to Four Roses and enjoy this interview with Brent Elliott, the master distiller for Four Roses. And joining me now to talk about the best bourbon of the century uh, on my list, um, Brent Elliott, master distiller for Four Roses. How are you, sir? Doing great, Fred. How are you doing? Um, you know, I'm living the dream. I get to... Um, I know, I know, distillers. You all get to taste a lot of whiskey, and you get a lot of, you get to do a lot of fun things. But uh, I, I think, I think I really do have the dream job because I get to taste everybody's whiskeys. And it was the 125th anniversary Four Roses Limited Edition that I believe is the best thing that's been made in this entire century so far. So, I don't know. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that. I'm a little partial to that one too, so I wasn't too surprised when you picked that one. <laughs> now, tell this was so this was this was put out before you were a master distiller, but you were still yes. a big part. You are you were a big part of the team. So te take us through uh, through that limited edition small batch and why it was so special. Uh, well, that one was kind of actually linked also to the 2012. If you taste that one, there's some similarities. Mm -hmm. And every year we try to do something different. You know, that's part of our uniqueness is the 10 recipes. So our intent every year is to create something totally different from years past. That was a bit of an exception because 2012 went over so well. People loved it so much. And we still had some of the barrels from the batches that were used in the 2012. Um, so that was kind of the approach was to make it different, but still try to take some of the uh, the better notes, the better qualities out of the 2012 and incorporate those into the 2013. So it was kind of built on that. And in particular, there's one batch that I believe we used it in the 2010 and then the 2012 and then the 130th. It was an extra aged, like 17 year old OBSV. I think in the 2012, I think it was 18 in the 125th. And so it was kind of built around that batch. That batch has very unique flavors of uh, like berries, raspberry, just a very unique fruitiness that is that really defined any mingling or any batch that it was blended with. And that was kind of how that one was built up was around those that flavor profile. And again, trying to 
recapture some of that magic from the 2012. And I think it succeeds and then some, but because I get asked all the time what my favorite of all of our releases is, and it's hard to answer. I end up you know, naming three, four, or five. <laughs> and it's interesting to note that those are the ones that have shown up on your list. And the 13 is always up there towards the top. I really, really enjoy that one. Yeah, it was so special. You know, and of course, uh, you know, it's when you had, you know, Jim Rutledge was, was the master distiller then. Uh, take us through take us through what it was like working with, with Jim, especially when you guys were having all these juggernaut releases. Well, by the way, there's never been a bad limited edition small batch come out of your uh, place. I mean, one that would be considered, you know, bad in comparison to others. It's still a 90... 91 point whiskey which would be every, you know a lot of other distilleries be their best thing that they've had in years so but take us back to what it was like working with with, with jim on uh, on this batch and some of the other uh limited edition products okay well i can tell you like when i first started you know i came into the industry and i was familiar with bourbon so i knew who jim was and you know it's a little intimidating to be you know working side by side with an icon and someone who's that passionate and that intense. But you've met Jim. I mean, immediately, you know, I realized that he was approachable, he was friendly, he was so helpful. So from the beginning, we had a great relationship, whether it was you know, working on batches of limited editions, other batches, uh, the distillery, you know, anything that I needed help with or any of the younger people at the distillery, I mean, he was a mentor. You know, we had guys like him, Al Young, John Ray, that, uh, really helped develop the team. And so it was always fun to work with Jim, and in particular on the limited editions, uh, because as you know, Jim has a wonderful palate, he knows what he likes. And so that was great to have a mentor like that and someone that I could work with on, you know, learning how to you know, develop the different flavors that you can achieve by bringing different batches together and seeing just how much magic, you know, that mingling process can bring to the final product. So with every one of these, every year, it was it was a fantastic experience. And it's still my favorite thing to do each year. So that was a real opportunity to get to work with Jim and to learn from him and really to do, I think, what he also enjoyed a lot too. I mean, there's, you know, there are a lot of sides to the title of Master Distiller, but the, the blending side is, I guess you get immediate results. You know, you're, you make whiskey and you sit on it for five, six, 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. But when you're actually going out and you get to survey these old barrels, we always had a blast with it. You know, it's funny, like he, when you were named um, his successor, um, it, it was kind of like, it was like he had just, uh, had his son get named to be the starting pitcher for the Yankees or something like he was so proud to see you be named um, as his replacement and um, I mean the things that he says about you he holds you incredibly you know high regard so I, I just I think that's just um, you know the that's one of the beautiful things of distilling is is the the chemistry you know between those you know who work together in the industry and uh, I just, I'm just glad to, you know, hear you remember those moments fondly with Jim like that. I, I can't say enough of how much I owe to him personally for what he's taught me, um, you know, how much he did for the brand. And you can't measure that. Mm -hmm. I mean, a man that passionate, that dedicated, that knowledgeable, you know, what he did for me and the brand, it's just remarkable. And of course, you know, you mentioned Al Young. Um, at the, the Al Young release also made the list. It came in at number at number six but we uh i wish i was al was here where i could talk to him but uh he he's he passed away you know in the last year and gosh i miss him he's he, i miss al yeah i miss al i talk to people every day even outside of four roses that that miss Al. i think you know everybody that he met um you know he touched he touched them whether it was just you know, as a person, as a brand ambassador, um, and for the people that didn't meet him, you know, I feel bad for them that they didn't get the opportunity. But uh, yeah, I can't say enough good things about Al, and we, we miss him terribly. You know, again, his contribution also can't be measured. You know, he was one of the original guys that helped 
you know, bring the brand back, helped mentor us, you know, the younger generation of Four Roses. And, you know, I think it's interesting because a lot of people don't realize because he became brand ambassador in 2008. So I'd always joke with him, you know, that's when he quit his real job and that's when he got to do, you know, what I think he was actually born to do. You know, he was on the technical side of things forever. You know, he was a distillery manager. He'd worked at Seagram's at different plants. And, but his background was actually theater. So you wonder how a, a non-technical person got involved in such a technical business, but, or technical role, but I mean, he did that one remarkably well. But I think when he transitioned from that side to being the brand ambassador, I think that was the best thing that could have happened to him and the brand, because that was the role that he was born to play. I mean, you know, I mean, the stories yeah. he could tell, the, the passion, I mean, he was just such a, such a warm and generous person that, that, you know, just happy that, you know, the last you know, 12 years of his life, I think that was really the pinnacle of his career, just getting to do what, what he probably loved the most. And speaking of Al's 50th, I know he loved that. And that was interesting too, because, you know, when he was actually in the production side or on the production side of, of Four Roses, he was involved in the tasting panel and he had a honed palate. He knew what he liked. Um, but so we kind of dusted him off and pulled him out of the retirement in 2017 when we developed this because it was to commemorate his 50th anniversary. And of course we wanted his participation, his buy-in, you know, it was for him. So we weren't going to release anything if he wasn't, if wasn't totally on board with it, if he weren't a part of it. And uh, so I know he enjoyed that. He loved it. He loved the final product. And so it's, I, that's always going to be one of my my favorites. That, along with the 2015, because that was the last year that mm -hmm. uh, you know that was like Jim's final final limited edition. So, you know, apart from the flavors and the the character of just the whiskey alone, there are stories behind each one of them that you know connect them to me in different ways. So those two are always going to be very special to me. You know, it's interesting, too, because Al and Jim had very different palettes and very different things that they liked. And, you know, for so many people, including myself, the Al Young release was such a uh, it was such a different, uh, more caramel bomb kind of flavor profile than what we're accustomed to with a very spice centric Four Roses. And it was to me, it, it was a it, it showed the beauty of of mingling or blending and it showed the talent that it takes to you know take so many barrels and know exactly what you want out of them and kind of put them together for a, a unique flavor profile and i think that al young edition was one of the greatest examples of why the people putting together the liquid matters so much yeah and i attribute that to al because when we first started that um, I went to him and I said, what do you want out of this? You know, give us an idea of where to start. And he had two two sort of guidelines or stipulations. He wanted to make it very unique. I actually had three. He wanted it to be from his tenure as distillery manager, which was easy because all of the older whiskey at the time had been produced when he was the manager. He wanted it to be unique and he wanted to incorporate an older batch. You know, the... The unique part was easy. I immediately started thinking, let's try some Q yeast strains or some Fs. The older part, that kind of, that was sort of the challenge and it's always the challenge. And so he kind of pushed it, you know, I, there was a, a good batch, a, a great batch that had been looked at for limited editions for a few years, like when it was 20, 21, 22 years old. And it was always kind of difficult to work with because it had a lot of good characteristics, but it also had a lot of oak, you know, 23 years old. But that was the batch that immediately came to mind to try to bring in to meet those requirements. And that was kind of the foundation that everything was built on. And it was more of a challenge than some in years past. Um, one, because it was going to bear Al's name and that was, you know, we really wanted to commemorate him, you know, take it up a level from, from years past and, and because of the, the extra age and to make it unique. So that was a learning experience and I think it was a good exercise mm -hmm. in just taking the blending, the mingling, the art of that to maybe the next level or a different direction. But you know, I'm super happy with how that turned out. And I know Al was too. Yeah. And, you know, again, it was just so different. But if you compare, if you compare the Al Young uh, to the 125th anniversary, 
I mean, you would, you would, it'd be very difficult to say that from the same distillery. That's how uniquely different they were. Yeah, you know? those two are very different. But they're both in the top ten. But the one that comes in at number one is the is the 125th anniversary. Um, I'm curious when you were when you all were batching that. How many different iterations did you have before you kind of come came to the final one? Uh, I would have to go back and check, but I would guess typically it's anywhere between 30 to 50 different test blends. And I'm sure that one was about the same. There are a few years that I can recall that it took very few or a few years where it took a lot. And mm -hmm. that one was somewhere in the middle. So it was probably somewhere between maybe 30 to 40. Interesting. So, and you guys have, you guys have, uh, you know, single uh, story warehouses. Uh, what, what, what impact do you think that a single story warehouse has over say like a multi-story one um that's got variations on all the floors do you get a little bit more consistency out of the single story yeah absolutely especially for the ages that go into our normal products our standard products so between you know five and ten years we see very little variation from the bottom to the top but it, it's interesting because we used to go out to 11 12 23 years you do start seeing differences. Those mm -hmm. tiny differences, as you extrapolate that that time, you start to see a, a big difference in proof and character between, say, a sixth tier and a first tier. So that's another consideration. You know, at the younger ages, that's a, a dimension that we don't really have to to really focus on or or work around because it's consistent. But you start getting out to these limited editions. Not only is it you know, three, four different recipes that go into it. But we also look at the tiers because the first through third tier of a seven tier old OBSK might be a lot different from a four through six. So we have to be conscious of that. Mm -hmm. And so the test blending does take on a different or an extra dimension, and that is elevation in the warehouse. Mm -hmm. And that's even, you know, but they're very consistent. And it may, because we use the 10 recipes, um, it's, it makes it so much easier at again between five and ten years because we don't have to worry about we can just say okay that batch can be used in here and we know that it's going to be consistent enough from the top to the bottom that it's not going to change but yeah again once you start getting out in age you have to consider that and now that you're you've been um you've got a you've got a good few years under your belt now as the as the master distiller and and this year, I think, is your best release um, that you've had. I thought last year's was great, but this year's limited edition small batch, Brent, it's really special. It is really exceptional. I appreciate you saying. Yeah, I I always wait a little while because when a batch first comes out after, you know, it's the initial bottling, it takes me a while to really let it sink in and evaluate in the context of all the other batches, you know, from years past. But I'm leaning towards that. I really, really like the 2019. I I see some similarities between like the 2015 and and a few others a little bit, but in particular the 15. But to me, it has um, a lot of similar characteristics, but the volume's turned up a little bit on it, a little mm. bit more layered, a little more complexity, and that's saying a lot because the 15 is that's always up there. It's one of my favorites. So that's kind of a benchmark that I'm comparing that to. But I inevitably see the parallels there. I'm not going to go so far as to say it's you know, top two or three yet, but the more I warm up to it, you know, I have, I really like that one. I'm really excited to, uh, to get to share this one. You know, we've just started releasing that. So, you know, and, and I, uh, if we were to like, so this list goes to the top 30, it's basically one every day for the month of September, Kentucky bourbon heritage month. And if we, if I was to expand it out to, uh, 100, I mean, every limited edition small batch would be on here. I mean, I it, it is it is year in year out a contender for whiskey of the year, whether it's my whiskey of the year or whiskey advocates whiskey of the year or any magazine or competition. I mean, it's just uh, consistently one of the most reliable. It's consistently it's the most reliable limited edition that is in the is in American whiskey, in my opinion. And um. I don't know how you guys do it, to be honest with you, because you, there's there's really not 
there's really not been a bad year for for the limited edition small batch maybe for you all because you're so nitpicky about it but for consumers we've loved them all well i appreciate you saying that so if we're so you let's let's go ahead and take a look at what are what are your favorite components of of doing these is it the, is it the older stocks or is it trying to find a way to get like a, a really good mid-age uh flavor to stand out with you know some of the oakier notes of say a 20 23 year old 19 year old well usually when i'm approaching this it starts out just evaluating between 15 and 20 batches that have been set aside you know, mm -hmm. age 10 to 20 some odd years so really the first step, so I can kind of manage that much information, that many different batches, I try to work on sort of a core to work around. And that could be one particular batch that is just very mellow and smooth, um, or maybe two batches brought together to create that base. And then from there, it's almost like dressing it with different components, whether it's maybe you know an F yeast strain or a Q or an O or the extra aged batches to try to bring it all together and see how it works. And there, there are a lot of hits, a lot of misses, a lot of surprises. Sometimes you bring batches together and it takes the whole blending process into a new direction. So that's why it takes 20, 30, 40, sometimes 60 or 70 test blends to, to finalize that. But that's generally the approach I take mm -hmm. because it's just, it's the habit I've gotten into the, the way that I've found it's the easiest to I guess uh, wrap my head around all of those different batches, and you know, finding a place to start to end up with a final, you know, unique, mellow, and just you know, great representation of the best that Four Roses can do each year. So I'm in the I'm in the uh, f uh, the F yeast fan club. Do you um, do you foresee any any more F yeast coming into the um, to to the to the batching process anytime soon. The more the uh, better. Very likely. Um, you know, intentionally this year, I didn't even play with any Fs, and that yeah. was. I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Fred. <laughs> but you know, Al's fiftieth. You know, I think that was defined uh, in probably that and the one thirtieth. I think the flavor profile on both those was really influenced by the F. And then we released Small Batch Select, which actually was came from the the learning from Al's 50th and the, the 130th, just you know, how well the F and the V work together. And so that learning was applied to the Small Batch Select. And so I felt like it was time to you know, offer something a little different, not lean on the F, because it is such a defining flavor. You put some F in there, it doesn't take a lot. And that will take that flavor profile in a totally unique direction. So with this, I thought it would be nice to try to, um, I, working on this, I think there were some cues, some um, test blends that utilize the cue, uh, but ultimately it kind of, the blend sort of dragged me back more towards the K's and the V's where it ended up, you know, OBSK, OESK, OBSV, OESV. And so I think with this one, it is, more the 2020 it's more of a balance of more of our core flavors it was just about layering those creating an elegant flavor profile a great finish and the thing that i really think is remarkable about this one is that uh 19 year old that's in there at 19 percent, and you can taste that mm -hmm. but it against the challenge of bringing the good characteristics you get from those older batches but mingling out the the more stringent or oaky characteristics so you want it in there just enough to let people know that it's you know, reminding them of that that rich um, aged character because that at the right level if you if you walk that fine line perfectly it can make a wonderful whiskey you, you go beyond that and it starts to become too flat you start to lose some of those more delicate vibrant flavors and I really think we've achieved that with this one. Are you laying uh, about equal parts amount of uh, the different yeast down in, in barrels right now? Obviously, the V yeast, because it's your your staple, gets the majority of the still time. But are the other yeast, yeast strains getting about the same amount of still time? Uh, the K gets, the V is the most, then the K, then the O, F, and Q. 
Hmm. And all that's just based on the you know, first it's a sales forecast and then kind of back into what we need to produce each year based on formula and you know evaporation rates and all that. So it really, if you look at all of our products and how much of each one of those recipes goes into each one of those, that's pretty much the proportion or the, the ratio that we use for production planning each year. Well, Brent, thank you so much for taking the time, uh, l you know, listening to you talk about um, the process. I have to tell you that every uh, Seagram's distilling guide and blending guide that I ever read from the, you know, 50s to the 70s, you're, you're, you're in, you're in like hugely in the Seagram's DNA there at Four Roses <laughs> with, with your technique. So that's pretty awesome, man. It's pretty awesome. Well, I want to thank you, Fred. This is an honor. We're all super excited about this, and uh, it was great talking to you. Good to see always, you. Always a pleasure, my friend, and I look forward to sharing a dram with you uh, in the future in person. So be safe. Hopefully very soon. I hope so. Right. Cheers, my Cheers, friend. Cheers, Fred.